symbol.
Uh, good evening, everyone. Welcome to the Explorers Club. Um, my name is Adam Morelli. I'm an artist and a member here, and I have the wonderful privilege to uh, introduce Peter Bellaby this evening. How many people are here at the club for the first time? Any first time? Oh, wow. Fantastic. So welcome to the club, um, and to the rest of you who are coming back, welcome back. It's so good to see everyone again. Uh, a brief introduction about the club. The club was founded in 1904. Uh, we're known as the Club of Firsts. So our members were first to the North, South Pole, um, top of Mount Everest, bottom of the Marianas Trench, and even the moon. Uh, so needless to say, we have a little bent for exploration, and I think that the globes will pair in well with the history here. Um, just to give you a little background and connection to it, I guess. If you can think back, does anyone remember the first globe that they came across, that they touched? Yeah? I mean, was it a smooth one, or was it the ones that were, had like the Andes that were snow-capped and you could rub your ridges on the fingers? I think it was amazing that they, they were fairly ubiquitous, and maybe I'm dating myself, but every classroom that I was ever in had a globe. And somehow they've disappeared. And along with them, I think the globe makers have vanished. Uh, so this is an, a really interesting reintroduction of something that we probably took for granted for a very long period of time. And one of the things that I love about Peter's approach is that not only is he resurrected a sort of classical style of globe making, but he's brought a bit of wonder back to the globe, which I think is very important. Um, I had the opportunity to meet, meet him in his workshop. I think we figured out it was 2014. Um, back when visitors could still sort of casually weasel their way in to see how these things were made. Um, and in North London, it, the experience in the workshop really does deliver to understand what goes into a globe because I think for the most part, we've always seen them finished. I never really thought about how a globe comes together and what it takes to become this seamless experience where all of a sudden this whole world makes sense to you. Um, for, I think it was just, uh, it was a wonderful opportunity and I'm going to let Peter come in and tell his story as to how he does this, uh, why he does it, and uh, really how he got started doing this initially. So, Peter Bellaby. Thank you very much everyone for coming out here on a Monday night. Um, it's wonderful to be back in New York. I used to come here quite a bit, but with, um, with COVID, um, we haven't been here since 2018, so it's really wonderful to be back and in this amazing building. Um, so, um, globe making. Um, globe making is publishing. Um, it's no different to, um, to making a book. Um, it's kind of... Um, in the olden days, um, globes were, would be manuscript globes. Um, they would be a sphere that you would paste um, your, your gauze. These are the sections that go onto a globe. Um, and you'd just paste them on blank, and then you'd, you'd put in all the cartography um, by hand. And that was what was called a manuscript globe, just like books were manuscript books back in the day. Everything was written by hand. And then as... Um, as color printing and as printing came in, then, um, then globes were able to be printed and they were able to be made in much greater numbers. Um, the first globe that was really, that's really recognized as the, the oldest surviving globe was made by a German, Martin Behaim, in 1492. So it was just before um, Columbus returned. So, so sadly, Sadly, the uh, Americas um, don't appear on his globe. <laughs> so, um, but, um, but it's definitely one of the, it's the oldest surviving, and it was, it was made in this manuscript way. So it's really one of a kind. You don't have, um, you don't have a whole series of them. As um, things developed and, and were able to print um, the cartography, then, then globe numbers became bigger, but they've always been um, a... Sorry, is everything okay? Okay. <laughs> I'll stand back now. No. <clears throat> but anyway, um, 
so my, my route into globe making um, is one of those things, buying presents for your father is really, really difficult. <laughs> so over the years, alcohol, I bought him cigars one Christmas. He's never smoked. Um, and it, it just became easier to not give presents and, and just be seen as forgetful. And so I kind of, um, for his upcoming 80th birthday is some time ago now, um, I thought I would make it, oh no, I thought I'd buy him a globe. So I went to Stanford's, a really famous map shop in Covent Garden. It's a, it, Sadly has moved, but it was in a beautiful uh, old building on, on Covent Garden's Long Acre. And I looked at all their globes, and I went up to the first one and gave it a quick spin, just like this, and it almost fell over. And my father was a naval architect. He, he definitely dealt in structures, and I think he would have um, been ashamed of me if I had bought him that one. Um, so I then went to auction houses, and I went to Christie's and Sotheby's and saw the price of... Um, Globes skyrocket. I, I, the first one I went to, I even got a paddle from the auctioneer, and I kind of lifted it up as one of those early bidders uh, when it was in the sort of hundreds of pounds, and then sheepishly hid it behind me as it went to 10,000, 20,000. And um, so I realized I couldn't, aff I couldn't afford that. Um, in fact, it would have been a way cheaper way of doing things um, had, than things actually ended up. But... Um, <laughs> But I definitely, I didn't want to have that. It, it, and also, they're wonderful, but they're out of date. And every time you spin them, another little territory flies off the, uh, off the globe. So I thought, I, I thought I'd make one. It was 2008, and I'd just been running, very weirdly, I've had a very odd career, but I'd been running a nightclub for... Um, <laughs> three years, and I um, kicked Amy Winehouse out more times than I can remember, and I kind of learned that this was a quick way into alcoholism, so I thought, um, I thought I'd give that up, and, and then I was doing a bit of property developing, and 2008 came along, and I'd, I'd just completed, I'd, I'd sold a house in, in early 2008, and then um, the guys on Wall Street and in London City decided to um, set off a, a big bomb and um, the 2008 financial crisis came along. And so I thought, no, I won't go into property. Um, I've got a bit of time on my hands. I'll make, make Dad this globe. So I set about doing this. And um, it's one of those things. I'd, I'd seen all these old globes and thought how amazing they were. And... I didn't for one moment think how difficult it could be. Um, so I gave myself three months, a few thousand pounds, and two years and well into six figures later, I produced the first Bellaby Globe, um, which I obviously, by this stage, I decided to set up a company. Um, it was costing way too much money, um, and I'd, I'd gone through I probably got into £20,000 within three months, which uh, I like my dad, but not, not really that much. Um, so, um, so I had to learn all, all these different things. I had to, um, the process of making a globe, I had to learn the cartography. I had to learn about product manufacture and design. I had to learn um, how to make a sphere. And the most important thing, and the thing that took me the time, was learning how to plaster a piece of flat paper onto a sphere. So I, I spoke to a paper conservator um, a couple of weeks ago, and she said to me, I've, I've been working in paper for 30 years. How do you do this? And I said, well, give me a year and a half of your time, and I'll show you. <laughs> um, it really is something I, I had. It was trial and error over and over and over again, repeatedly trying out different things. I had. I didn't know whether I had the right paper. I didn't know whether I had the right glue. I didn't know whether I needed special water. I, I just had no idea. So I was trialing different things. I started off using wallpaper paste, um, which didn't really work very well. Um, but eventually, after the two years, um, I kind of I was happy with where I was, and I started um, I started marketing um, the globes, and. Um, 
yeah, it's kind of, um, sorry, hold on a second. Da, da, da. Yeah, the, the, the one thing that really dawned on me very, very quickly um, in terms of um, making spheres is there is a very, very sensible reason why buildings have straight sides. Um, <laughs> working with pi just essentially just makes, multiplies every error by pi. <laughs> so you're kind of, you're, you're trying to, and you can't, when you're working with straight sides, if things go wrong, um, you can, you can kind of just extend one side a little bit more. But when things go wrong with the sphere, you just have to start again. And that's the one thing I, I learned. Um, I just had to um, repeatedly do things over and over again. So I, I was learning how to make a, the actual sphere. At the beginning, our company now um, um, has a subcontractor who, may, who make our spheres um, to an incredibly um, good tolerance. But um, to begin with, I was, I was making them um, and I was having to work out how I was going to make them. So I came up with different ideas, but eventually I stuck with the idea of getting two spheres, um, two hemispheres, and then I would glue them together. And I was using Plast of Paris. I, I'd seen a few kind of videos on YouTube of, of people making, making videos from back in the, uh, I don't know, the 60s or 70s, and they're, they're using Plast of Paris. And I thought, oh, that's a traditional... Um, material to use. Plus the Paris, um, it gets followed by like Saharan levels of dust every time you deal with it. So I, I just moved, um, I just remodeled my house and I had, um, I had some sort of aberration as I was doing the remodeling and I, I decided I would have bright red carpet throughout the house. And, and I started off um, the company in, in my dining room and living room and, um, and as I was casting these spheres every single day, the dust would just go throughout the house. So I spent probably half my time hoovering up the house three, t three times a day. And I had little... So I, I then um, worked out. I put some plastic sheeting um, on, the, on the stairs to stop the, the dust going upstairs. And I these, had these two beautiful little cats, and they would, they would find the little hole in the plastic sheeting and, and just stand there with their tail, like opening up the, the plastic sheeting for the plaster dust to just cover the, um, cover the house. But anyway, um, as I was doing this, there were, there were so, many, so many new questions the whole time. So obviously, the Earth is not actually a sphere. It's an oblate spheroid, so um, because the... Um, because the Earth is spinning, there's centrifugal force um, pushing out the equators and, and squeezing the poles a bit. So um, to begin with, I was thinking, well, do I make every single globe I make an oblate spheroid? Um, and then there's another, um, another thing you have to work out when you're making a globe is you have to balance them correctly. Um, so traditionally, globes are made um, so they will sit um, on a often a wooden stand, and they'll have a meridian that goes around them, um, and then you will spin them um, via an axis um, clamped to the meridian. And obviously, I wanted the globe to spin and, and naturally come to a beautiful halt, like um, very slowly, rather than just sort of counterbalancing like this very awkwardly. Um, so I worked out um, how to balance a globe. I had to, um, I had to drill, well, Kind of like um, like um, car tire balancing. I would spin the globe and then I'd uh, stick lead weights to various different points um, on the globe and then spin it again and find the correct points. I don't. Um, there wasn't great um, science behind it, but it worked pretty much every time. And then we simply had to drill holes into the spheres and stick the the um, lead weights on the inside and then refinish the outside. So it was, a, it was a really good process, but um, the problem was I used lead weights. And what I didn't realize with um, customs is that often um, when you, um, things pass through customs, they don't always have Geiger counters to hand. Um, they have x-ray machines, so they can tell if a metal is heavy, but they can't tell um, whether that metal is radioactive or not. So um, the first globe I sent over to America 
was actually smashed in half um, by customs, who, um, who kind of then put the globe back together with the north of South America sort of <laughs> ab above Africa. And they sent it on to this wonderful customer in Colorado. And he phoned me up and he said, Peter, there's a bit of a problem. Um, it seems to have come apart at the, uh, at the equator. And I'm like, there's just no way that's come apart at the equator. And to this day, I don't know how they did it. I, it, it wasn't a hammer. I, I suspect it was um, um, some very sharp knives, but um, evidently they, they thought they'd, uh, someone thought they'd come across some amazing contraband and they were going to get a, an instant promotion, but instead of which, um, we just had to remake a globe. But um, so, then, um, so then I was in a, um, so I started in my house. There were so many tangents to my story because there were so many things I had to learn on the, on the way and so many different things that happened. But one of the, one of the things that happened was um, I started in my house and then I went to a studio where I got kicked out of because I created too much dust. And then I found a shop on a back street um, in, um, in Stoke Newington where we are close to now. But um, we, um, I moved in there, and I spent a year there. And the, I was selling one or two globes. This was actually in 2010. So I was selling them, but I, I wasn't actually able to make them yet. Um, so I would have all the locals from the area. There was a big plate glass window on the front of the shop. And I'd have all the locals from the area um, come along and give me advice on, on how I should make a globe. Um, what designs I should do, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and this was going on um, every single day to the point that I just um, kept the door closed and didn't, didn't really engage. Um, but then I had, some, I had some wonderful things happen there. Um, one day, an elderly gentleman knocked on the door, and he introduced himself, and he said, my name's James. Um, I've noticed what you're doing, and I think you need a bit of help. And I said, yeah, a lot of people um, think I need a bit of help, but it might be in the head rather than um, anywhere else. But um, so he, um, he, he said he knew something about fonts, um, but he would come back the next day. So I checked him out online, James Mosley. Um, he lived about 10 doors from the studio, and he's the leading, um, leading person in fonts and typography in the world, lectures all around world um, and he wonderfully lent me his own special font that we now use on most of our globes um, so as this was happening um, things seemed to be things seemed to be happening that were were helping me out um, and then um, one um, a, a Someone who ran an artist studio in East London um, phoned me up and said, oh, we want to commission five globes. And they were 80 centimeters. I'm very good on sizes, so I think that's 80 centimeters. Um, and um, she wanted five 80 centimeter globes. And then an American customer wanted a 127 centimeter globe. Now, the problem with London is we have very old housing and shop stock. So, um, our doors are really small. <laughs> so, um, so the shop had a door width of 60, I think it was 65 centimeters. So at that point, I actually had to move into a new premises. So I moved, astonishingly, from a premises with 350 square feet to one with 5,900 square feet. So at this stage, there was myself. I had a painter part-time helping me, um, and I had someone helping me with some of the woodwork, uh, or with all the woodwork, but um, it was, I was probably utilizing him for like two days a month. Um, so uh, I was very lucky that um, my painter knew a lot of people from art school, so I ended up with a little we work situation in this enormous, um, enormous workshop. So we had about 35 people um, in, the comp in the studio. Um, and that's kind of the thing that kept the wolves from the door for the first um, sort of five years because um, it, it took a long time to actually get, um, get, uh, get the company to actually um, make any money. We're, I didn't really realize, um, 
I was kind of the whole thing had not been planned at all. So I'd, I'd because it was just supposedly this present I was going to give my father. Um, <laughs> I hadn't really made any plans. So the first globe I sold to a librarian in Brisbane for I think it was eight hundred and ninety pounds. Um, I think it cost two and a half thousand pounds to make. I just was <laughs> living in cloud cuckoo land. Um, but anyway, um, we kind of, um, we had an exhibition in the Royal Geographical Society there in London, the first ever um, exhibition on globes. And that's where we, we showcased our, our new Churchill globe, which was this 127 centimeter globe. This is an interesting one because I'd, um, I'd found out that during the war, um, Churchill and Roosevelt had both been gifted globes by the army in, in Christmas 1942. And it was, it was a great PR exercise. It was one of the earliest exercise of, uh, exercises of PR. And um, the two of them were photographed with their amazingly large globes. And they were identical and had um, um, codes all, or had numbering all around so they could tell exactly where they were referencing in their conversations. But um, it started me out on a little um, quest to try and find out where Churchill's globe was, because I, I searched on Google and couldn't find um, where it was. So I, I, um, I'd suspected it was at Chartwell, which was his, um, his home after the war. So I phoned up Chartwell, and a very well-spoken English um, gentleman answered the phone and said, no, no, we don't have a, um, a globe here. And so I ended up writing to Chartwell, Blenheim Palace, the Cabinet War Rooms, the Royal Collection, Downing Street. It was at this stage I realized that people really resonate with globes. Downing Street, that's the uh, slightly small equivalent of your White House, um, called me the following morning. Um, everyone wrote back. Um, everyone was so wonderful and, and thrilled with what I was doing, but no one knew where the globe was. <laughs> Meanwhile, um, someone who worked in the um, UK Cartography Institute told me it was definitely at Chartwell. So I'd, um, I'd kind of hooked up with a, um, with a writer who was writing a book on maps, and he, he wanted to um, document me making this large globe. And so um, we found out, this lady told us it was definitely at Chartwell. So, so we drove down there. The same um, voice um, uh, from the same gentleman who I'd spoken to on the phone um, was at reception. I said, um, we're here to see Churchill's Globe. And he said, Churchill's Globe, it's amazing. Let me show you where it is. It's in his studio. And, um, and then I said to him, I'm, I spoke to you last, well, last month or so, um, and you told me it wasn't here. And he said, yeah, yeah, all the other museums have their designs on it, so we, haven't, we just keep it very um, low-key. <laughs> so, but, um, I mean, the, the, that uh, was an amazing thing, which later on, I guess, um, two years into the production, I had a phone call from an American gentleman called Brad Davenport, and, and he's, he kind of introduced himself, and um, he kind of, he, I thought I recognized the name, but um, he, he just um, basically said that his father was Captain Davenport of the US Army, and he'd delivered the globe to Churchill in the war. Um, and I then had a lovely conversation with his elderly mother, um, for about half an hour, finding out about the, the whole project, finding out about how um, they'd had to give General de Gaulle a lift back to Africa after they delivered the globe to Churchill um, because he was trying to do something in Africa with the resistance, um, and, um, and learnt about the adventure of actually delivering where they'd started out via Newfoundland and then they'd come across some bad weather. It was December after all, so they'd then swung back, as you do, and go through Brazil um, and across the Atlantic. I mean, it must have been the most torturous um, route. But it got there in the end to Churchill, and as I say, it was a great, um, great PR moment for the, for the two leaders. Um, and um, 
so Churchill's is now um, very much on display there, um, as is the one that was given to Roosevelt, which is in, um, I believe, in the Library of Congress in Washington. But um, the company, meanwhile, we, we really weren't kind of selling that many globes. Um, I think I was selling... In 2011-12, we were selling one a month, and, and it was quite slow. Um, we'd had this exhibition, and we'd, we'd got a few um, sales from that, but it wasn't really, um, wasn't really going anywhere. So then my partner, Jade, who is here, I'm sure some of you might have spoken to her, um, I managed to persuade her to leave her job and, uh, because she didn't really enjoy it, but I didn't, I didn't say, come and work for me. But she got bored at home after a couple of weeks, so she said, I'll, I'll, I'll come in and, and man the phones. I didn't tell her at the time that the phone averaged one call a week. Um, <laughs> but she came in, um, and yeah, within five minutes, she realized the phone didn't ring. And so she set about um, increasing our social media profile, which... I'd done a little of, I'd kind of, um, I'd had a few photo shoots with, with magazines and I'd shot a video, but Jade, um, Jade knows her stuff um, and she, um, she started in introducing, um, or started, started uploading um, lots of beautiful images like this to Instagram and she started following the right people on Instagram and then she discovered this video I'd made and um, we went from my family and friends following me on Instagram to within about two years, 150,000 followers. Um, and this video I'd made that had had um, half a dozen views um, went up to, I think it's now 750,000 views. Um, and I didn't realize that this was an amazing way of um, promoting the company. I, f for me, um, I'm, I'm almost 60. Um, I thought that um, Instagram would very much be just young young kids um, interacting with it, but it, it was an amazing thing. Um, it's something that um, magazines used, certainly at the beginning, as a wonderful way of finding interesting content. It was kind of a one-way process back then, so you could flick through and you could see a lot of things um, very easily. And so we were inundated um, with... Uh, um, with requests for um, photographs and um, and shoots and videos and <clears throat> you can probably tell um, I'm really comfortable in front of the camera. Um, um, it's not really something uh, I'm that uh, <clears throat> um, that enamoured with. But um, for for probably a year and a half, um, I was doing two photo shoots a week. We were doing video shoots um, and. It was wonderful working with, actually, with um, all these, um, these teams of um, videographers. We had um, kind of culminated in CBS um, coming over in 2018, and they did a wonderful shoot. It was over three days. It was like a movie. At one stage, I've got this really old um, 1960s car, and at one stage, um, we had um, the presenter next to me in the car. Um, we had GoPros on either side of the dashboard on the um, um, radiator grill at the front. We had a car in front of us, a car behind us, and we were driving about 300 yards. But it was, um, <laughs> it was all morning, but it, it, um, it created a lot of publicity. And, um, and then it went out on CBS Sunday morning, um, a, a seven-minute clip. And we went from having a wait list of, of a month or two to a wait list of 18 months. Um, and then, rather wonderfully, they repeated it again six months later. And, um, and it's, um, we now have a team of 26 people, um, and we produce about 500 globes a year. Um, Jade also, at this stage, um, introduced the idea of personalization onto globes. So, um, and this is something that really resonates with customers. I, I had kind of thought it was a bad idea at the beginning because I just thought it would, be, um, it would be a struggle making sure that all the right things go onto the right globes and find themselves in the right customer's house. 
Um, but we, we've worked through um, how to do things. And now people um, put their whole life journeys um, onto our globe. So we, so we have one recently we've worked on, which is um, a polar explorer, and it's depicting their travels to the North Pole and the South Pole, the routes they use, the, the, the highlights the, um, of photographs that they took on, on both poles. And it's a really, um, it's a wonderful thing. We had one recently of a, a family's journey over generations where the grandparents came from Eastern Europe and then they moved to Western Europe and then they took boats across to um, the US and their, originally their families would be on the East Coast and then they'd move further afield. And, and they're, they're really um, depicting, um, it's, it's their own kind of exploration of the planet in a sense and, and their, own, their own journey. And, um, and we're also, the one thing I've learned is that the more bespoke and the more original, um, the more fun it is. Um, so we, um, We've done. We've made egg globes in the past um, for a charity, um, and in fact, we were here in 2014 at a, an auction that, where one of them was auctioned. But we had one recently where a customer asked for um, three petals um, cast in bronze um, to be supporting the globe with hidden roller bearings. Kind of like you might have seen the little one outside. Um, we use a roller bearing system. And so we had three petals, which I had to firstly have drawn in, in CAD um, software. Then we had to have um, printed in 3D printing. I never imagined we'd, we'd be using 3D printing in anything we're doing. But so it was um, 3D printed. And then we had each petal was split into four. That had to come to the studio. We had to glue them together, finish them off, send them up to the foundry. They cast them in bronze. Um, then they came back to us. We then had to polish them. My, um, my metal worker never forgave me, I think. The um, metal is, um, is, you can do everything with metal you can do with wood. It just takes you six times the, the amount of time. So we polished that beautifully, and then it had to go to the engraver because the gentleman wanted his three children's names, one on each petal. Um, and it looks absolutely beautiful. And meanwhile, his globe was being made with all the undersea cables um, that connect all the continents. So our, we have a team of three cartographers um, who are not only constantly updating um, our maps, um, they're also obviously doing all customers' um, personalizations. So this one um, took them, they do all the research, they find out um, what they, the customers ask for, um, and we will add that on. So this one had all the, all the undersea cables. Um, and, um, and the one thing um, I've also learned is that um, with Instagram, it's, it isn't just the children following. We, we have people um, who have commissioned globes, who um, have commissioned our largest globes, and they write to Jade and they say, um, I know you're making my globe at the moment, but I haven't seen it on Instagram. Um, or, or, or even IG, which is apparently the new paraphernalia. But, um, <laughs> But, um, and they, they demand to see their globe um, in construction um, on Instagram. Um, so it's, um, it's been a wonderful um, way of us reaching um, our customers because we do, everything we do is bespoke. And it obviously is much better for us to be working directly with everyone rather than going through any, any sort of retail stores because that would just um, add to the complexity. But um, there's obviously many, um, many things we've had to remember over the years um, to ask customers um, when they're ordering. One of them, as I highlighted earlier, is how big are your doors? So um, I had a Spanish customer come to the studio, wonderful man, has a castle in Spain, um, as you do. and. Um, he, uh, he loved an 80 centimeter globe about this big and he said, it's going in my office, I'm in my beautiful castle in Northern Spain. And, and so I said, so are the doors big enough? And he said, yeah, definitely big enough, definitely, uh, definitely larger than 80. So he phoned up um, his wife in Spain and she went to, to measure up and 
She said it was 55 centimeters. <laughs> and he said, that, that's rubbish. I'm, someone's, someone, she's got the wrong tape measure or whatever. And um, he went home and he phoned me up and he said, Peter, they're 55 centimeters. Um, but don't worry, I've already arranged it. I'm going to knock down the wall. You're going to deliver the globe. We're then going to rebuild the, glo the, the wall. Um, so that globe is now imprisoned in his office. <laughs> we also had another gentleman in Miami who, um, who ordered a, a globe. Uh, he ordered our Churchill globe, which is, it really is enormous. It's, it's 50 inches. I mean, it kind of stands this high. It's pretty much the largest printed globe, which is what we are doing, that's ever been made, the same size as the ones that Churchill and Roosevelt had in the war. And he saw the, um, the um, skit on CBS and was so impressed with, with it, with what he saw, that he ordered a globe um, before the end of the seven-minute show. I think he perhaps had heard of us before, but he hadn't introduced himself to us before. So we normally, um, we normally have a long conversation with people when they're going to commission a 127-centimeter globe. But he bought straight away. And again, how big are your doors? Um, he said, well, I'm on the 20th floor of an apartment in Miami. I'll check the lift um, door sizes which weren't big enough, and so um, we ended up um, craning the globe up the outside of the building to get into his 20th store penthouse, but, um, but he was very happy in the end. <laughs> the one thing as well with globe making, which I n had no idea about at the beginning, is how political it can be. It really is, um, it's something, um, that I, it didn't even cross my mind. The first few globes I sold, well, there was one to Australia, and then uh, a few to America, Europe. There wasn't really a, an issue, so I, I had what I felt was the, the, um, the correct map on there. Obviously, um, Taiwan isn't recognized by China, so sadly, if we want to sell any globes in China, we have to um, mark Taiwan as Chinese Taipei. Um, and if, um, if we don't do that, it just simply gets impounded and destroyed. Um, and so, um, so we have to be very careful. In India, I can go to prison, apparently, for six months if, I don't, if we don't demark the border, the correct border, um, or as uh, the Indian government sees fit, um, with, um, between um, India and Pakistan, um, so that um, Jammu and Kashmir is is seen as part of India and there's not a, a disputed border. And th there are things like that that I just had no idea about at the beginning. There are, um, um, and so um, I, th I think ultimately th this journey has been one where I've had to learn so many different things, none of which I knew at the beginning. And um, I've, I've gradually learned them over the period almost through um, through trial and error, every single the making the globe at the beginning was trial and error. error. But but even even the simple act of shipping is trial and error. You don't know how something is going to land in a foreign country without trying something out. And um, but it's been a, a rather wonderful journey. And as I say, I now have um, twenty six people um, and um, creating. Um, creating wonderful globes to customers um, all around the world. And we, we ship, I think we've shipped to probably 60, 70 countries by now. Um, and America um, is um, by far our largest market. But um, that's, uh, that's kind of my, um, my story. Um, and um, I don't know whether Adam would like to do some um, some questions for now, um, but thank you very much. So we thought we'd open this up for some questions. Felix, do you have the audience microphone? So for simplicity's sake, I'll call on you. Felix will give you a microphone. Peter will do the answering. Um, the, only thing that we discussed earlier is that if we could ask maybe one part, two part, not 17 part questions, it's a little challenging to get back through all of them. So if you have 
more than one question, fire one or two, pause, we'll get to Peter, and then we'll go back to you. Um, we'll go number one. Yeah, how long is the wait list now to get a globe? It's around about four months to a year and two months, depending on the size of globe. The, the, um, the desktop globes tend to be four to six months. Yes. Uh, do you date the globes, and does the artist who does it sign them? Yes, we, we date all the globes. Um, the, the interesting thing about globes is that you can pretty much date every globe that's ever been made within a couple of years because countries do really change um, that often. Um, and our artists don't specifically um, sign, but, uh, but many customers, everything we're doing is bespoke. So many customers will say, can, can your artist sign my globe? I want to know who's made it. We have... So I don't know whether we had one up here. I don't think we did. We have so many images of a globe with all the team who've been involved in making that particular globe, which for a, for a mini globe or a, a pocket globe like the one outside, it's maybe four or five people. For the Churchill, the large globe, it, it could be 18 people involved um, in, in the production process. There's so many different aspects involved. Oh, yes, he did. Um, yeah, there are, um, I missed that in, in my presentation. Um, yes, he did. He got globe number four, and, and my mother cajoled him into saying thank you and being appreciative. <laughs> okay, here. Peter, thank you for being here. Um, I'm fascinated by your trajectory from having a club for three years, and then you get a gift for your father. You can't find the perfect, this is such a story about not finding the perfect gift, but who turns it into like the most incredible company in such a unique area? You're the only game in town in so many ways. I need to know, early on in the game, was there anything in your personality that really turns you on about globes and the way things are in the world that made you do this? I guess I've always been fascinated with globes. So when I got my first laptop, I remember drawing in Microsoft Paint, a really crude version of, of our planet, which I drew freehand. Um, so I've always had that fascination, and I've always wanted to work for myself. So I, I've kind of, um, I worked in television for, a num for, I guess, seven, eight years um, in my 30s, and then um, it's very lucky um, in the UK when you get made redundant, um, it, it can be a very good thing. So I got five years' salary um, to be made redundant, and so I kind of set myself up doing some property developing, and then I help this friend um, with this venue. Um, so I've kind of, I've always wanted to do my own thing. And this, this was just me being ridiculously overconfident in my ability to do something that I could see that people two, three hundred years ago had done in incredibly well. And, and I just, I genuinely thought I can, I can do that in a few months. Go towards the back, all the way in the back. Just so we don't lose that one the hearth of the fireplace. Do you ever do other planets? We do. We do um, the moon pretty well. We, get, we have a contact at the European Space Agency. So we do the moon. We do Mars. Um, we don't really go beyond that. Mars is relatively um, red. Um, <laughs> There's, there's not an awful lot going on there. There, there are, there's a number of obviously features of, of various people in um, astronomy over the years who, who um, mark things out there. But most of the rest of the planets, um, I don't think we'll ever make them. There's just, um, there's nothing of note. Half of them are gaseous anyway, so they're, they're just a colour. Um, so they're not, um, they're not really going to do it. But we do a celestial globe as well. So we do a celestial globe with the stars, um, which is quite popular. Felix, you can choose. You're right next to them. Who prints your globes? 
One of the things I was very lucky with at the beginning is how printing technology had evolved over the last um, few years. So if I'd started this 10 years earlier, I, I don't think I would have been able to do it. In fact, even, even in 2008, I was, I was going around to printing houses like, um, like newspaper printing houses where they do the four color um, lithographic printing and I was assuming I was going to have to do that. Um, and, but luckily, wide format printing, um, like the printing you can get in a print shop um, on Fifth Avenue, um, it's, um, it's come, come in leaps and bounds. Um, and so the, print, the inks they use are guaranteed between 80 and 200 years, which basically means um, they, they obviously can't say Nothing lasts forever, but it's a it's a pretty um, solid thing. So we do it all in house. We have a bank of huge um, printers, and we do everything in house. And we also work with um, our watercolor supplier. Um, we work with their chemists to make sure that all the watercolors we're using are the most light fast that we can use. Um, as you've scaled up, have you maintained quality? And do you see there being like a limit on terms of production that you'd want to produce each year? Um, we have an incredible team who are QCing the whole time. In fact, our, we QC now more so than we ever have done. Uh, we'll never become big. We're, if we get to 1,000 globes a year, that will kind of be it. I, don't, I'm, I might move the company in a different direction, but this element of the company will stay bespoke and will stay very unique. We know... The globes move through the studio um, and we reference them by the name of the customer. They don't get referenced by a number or anything. We, we know what's going on and it's a really lovely way of doing it. And the, the studio is, is such a lovely environment um, for everyone to work in. I don't, um, I don't want to turn it into a factory where, where I've got um, um, 100 people churning things out. I think it's, very, it's part of what we do. It's very bespoke, it's very unique. And, and I think I, I want to man, maintain that. Yes, another candelabra. Um, do people request globes in other languages than English? And if so, how do you approach that? Um, yes, they do. We, we don't do many, though. We have a German, a couple of German versions. We have a Chinese version of one size, I think. We have... Arabic versions. Um, the Arabic one particularly, um, I, so we, we started off uh, with this with a, a friend of mine doing the translation. Um, he's, he speaks English, French, Spanish, Latin, um, Italian, Russian, um, Arabic, and um, so he was actually studying Arabic. In fact, he was studying law at the time and doing Arabic as a, as a, a module. And his teacher um, became the, the QC of his work. Um, and obviously, I'm, I'm not an expert on, I'm terrible at languages, actually. I did French for 12 years, and I still can't even say yet, um, hello. But, um, <laughs> but um, so his teacher checked it, and then we sent it to the customer, and we said, right, this is where we feel we're at, um, and um, have a look and, and check um, and, and see that you're comfortable with it. And, and they, were, they knew this, that they would have to do that. Um, so we'll always involve with something like that. Well, certainly with a, a, um, a non-Latin -Latin language, we would, we would insist that the customer be involved. Yes, actually. Um, one, one of the stories that you said that the, the, the globe didn't pass through something, you know? So I, this today, my junior in my museum that I am running in Washington told me that the big globe that we have in the office, we need to restore, didn't go through the, the door. <laughs> so, <laughs> so it was the same thing. Yeah. So I don't know how they put in. You know, so maybe we have to use the crane, you know, to bring <laughs> yeah, outside. Yeah, yeah. Uh, actually, but it uh, has to be restored because it's old, about 80 years old. So, and 
how, what, what is the process to restore something like that? So the difficulty with, with globes is just the, this um, void on the inside of them. And you often don't know how the structure is, is actually made. So you need to, to begin with, get it x-rayed um, so that you, you can find out its structure. And then you can begin to work on, I suppose, how, how you would um, make that structure um, better founded. But the, the actual the external artwork I mean, we're definitely not, we don't do any restoration, and, and I'm very much speaking as a layman in restoration. There are some amazing restorers in Europe, and um, restoring a globe costs a lot of money. You, you, will, probably need, you will probably need sponsors. But, um, yeah. but if it's a special globe, um, tell me about it afterwards. If it's a special globe, you, you should, and I can put you in touch with... I can put you in... Yeah, and I'll put you in touch with some amazing restorers. What else can you say about the uh, sphere manufacturing and the materials or what kind of knowledge base it comes out of? I suppose what I learned was I discovered that Plaster of Paris doesn't have longevity. So we've moved now to GRP fiberglass, which, which is much more structurally sound. Um, it's also very light, so we still we actually have to put weights on the inside to make it make it heavier, to, um, because otherwise it, it, our roller bearing system, like the one you've seen outside, wouldn't really work. But um, these, I suppose, the small ones are made of, of resin. Um, we we use modern composites. We're kind of amalgamating the traditions of how globe making was, but we're using modern materials, com composites, um, and tooling where, where we can so that we, um, all our globes will last as long as possible. Does that answer your question? I have many more questions on that, but I'll ask it afterwards. Okay. Uh, Peter, what is the most impressive thing you're proud of other than your globes? Within the globes. Say, say again, sorry. And what's the most impressive thing you're proud of other than your globes? <laughs> Buying an Aston Martin DB6 at the dip of the pricing in 2001. I got one for 12,000 pounds. I, I did spend about 40 on it. <clears throat> but I then sold it for 58,000 um, sort of six, seven years later. And that's, the company would not be where it is now without that. That was a <laughs> 58,000 pounds injection into paying off credit card bills. Um, and um, that's kind of my, I, I now have a, um, a really old Bentley S2 from 1962, which I'm um, turning into an electric car. So that's kind of, what I'm proud of. Yes, in the middle. Um, <clears throat> are you familiar with this huge globe uh, on 42nd Street? I don't know if it's still there. Uh, the Daily News building. I think possibly. I, so um, obviously, as I mentioned, what we're doing is printed globes. There are. Um, there are many structural globes that are made of metal or made of other materials all around the world that are enormous. Um, but um, I, think it's, um, I think it's a metal structure one, is it? I'm not sure. Yeah, um, I'll, um, I'll, I'll wander by. I haven't, I'm not, I, I definitely have seen globes around and about in, in New York, but I don't, um, I'm not totally familiar. And one further question. Many, many years ago, I bought from the National Geographic Society a uh, topographical map of the world. And I think it was made of injected mold of some sort. So you can see the mountains. Uh, I don't know how they did it, but that was rather interesting. So the, 
we, we've kind of we get asked every so often will we um, put mountain ranges and things on and we, we do do that um, visually by um, by our watercolor artists but when you shrink the globe our, our wonderful globe to the size of a snooker ball it's actually smoother than a snooker ball um, so it kind of brings into perspective the fact that if you're putting mountain ranges um, as a feature onto a, a globe that's this big, they would they would be if they're done to scale, they would be absolutely tiny. You wouldn't you wouldn't notice them. Um, apart from that, it would be really difficult to do. I don't um, I don't want to get into the commercial market of of um, of molding things like that. I think that's um, it, it works really well. I, I would never take anything away from any commercial manufacturer making globes because every globe is amazing and has a purpose and has a function. Um, we just want to do things in a, in a bespoke, um, hand, handcrafted way. Um, hi, thank you for this very interesting presentation. Have you had a request that um, you weren't able to fulfill? The, the wonderful thing about this is we do get asked lots of crazy questions of things to do, and we almost always say, yes, we can do it, um, because it's, it's really fun doing new projects. It's, um, um, so I'm trying, to, I'm trying to think. I'm not... I mean, obviously, people don't ask crazy, crazy questions, um, but I don't think there's anything... I think most things we would tend to say, yeah, we'll, we'll have a crack at that. Um, and give it a go. Um, is it ever possible to revise the globe, like as maps, of, you know, as countries' borders change? No, but a, for me, a, a globe is very much a, a point in history. So when you're, you're buying a globe in 2023, it's very much a historical document of 2023. So you, in 2000. 33, you can reference it and see how the world was at that point. So I, um, we do get asked um, this question, and it, I think I just encourage people to buy a second globe. <laughs> um, so every time you make a map, you open up the promise to exploitation. So I'm sure that weighs heavily on you uh, as a map maker. Um, and I was really wondering if you've had any requests to make a, a globe that expresses the topography of the underwater ocean. Even though the ocean hasn't been completely mapped, it's only been mapped in few select parts. There's, I guess, some speculation that comes in place of, of research until research can be done. I, I'm yeah. wondering if you've taken on the challenge of trying to make a globe with what knowledge of the bottom of the ocean looks like to our degree that we know right now. And of course it's important because where we're going to get our minerals for our next, uh, for your electric car, are gonna come from the near, near the shore marine environment probably. Yeah. It's just a reality of the new mining industries that are, uh, are emerging. So I'm just wondering what you, what you feel like as a map maker is your responsibility for uh, making a globe um, for the health of the future health of the of the planet, but then also how do you deal with something like uh, making a map of the underground ocean when our knowledge is incomplete? Yeah, so we we obviously get asked to do um, many different things. Um, we've done um, we've made globes with the ocean currents, with the trade winds, with with things like that. But it's we've never really been asked for. Um, a detailed and obviously within the remits of what is possible because as you say so much is not um, not mapped so um, we would we would give it a go if someone said I want you to do this um, we would definitely give it a go but it's um, we are led by demand um, and the one thing I would say about making globes is when you the, the most amazing thing is when you put the final piece of gore onto your sphere and then suddenly 
you, you've kind of made a globe. And it, it does make you um, feel very protective um, towards the planet. Um, we, we're a small company. We do things very ethically, as ethically as we can. We pay very good salaries to the people who work for us. So we, we try and do things um, in a way um, that, that I feel proud of. But um, beyond that, um, we, we kind of, um, we, there's a limit to what we can do. We obviously um, have a charitable side and, and do charitable work. Um, we did a lot in Ukraine in the last um, year or so. But, um, but no, um, it, making, a, making a globe and seeing all these planets, when you wander around the studio, it's, it's such a beautiful, um, um, a beautiful studio, but seeing all, seeing all these mini worlds, it does really make you protective. It makes you wish we hadn't done what we've done for the past 200 years. I think we'll do two more questions. Yeah. Have you ever actually gotten in trouble with any of the countries that you mentioned that are a little sensitive about how you label boundaries and possessions? Only financially. Um, no, it's not. Um, um, customs are um, kind of, a, it's the most interesting industry. They are as unaccountable as you can possibly be. You can, they could smash every single globe we ever make for the rest of my life and still we wouldn't be able to sue them or find out who smashed it up. They are, they're so unaccountable. So no, we just, um, we just make sure we've got our bases covered to begin with. No outstanding prison term in India? Um, no, no, I like India as well. <laughs> Hi, Peter. Uh, the Churchill Globe um, you were referring to, where was it made? The, the original one for, yeah. um, it was made by um, Weber Costello in Chicago, I believe. Um, they had a team of cartographers working on it who all, um, the beauty about globes is people don't notice things. So um, the, all these cartographers put in their hometowns um, <laughs> on their globes. And, and there's no real, there's no um, world body of cartography. As I said, countries have different ideas about what they see as the world. So um, um, the one thing that I really love about this job is that I don't have an organization above me saying, this is how you should do it. We can just, and we say, say this to customers all the time, you can do this exactly as you want. You can change all the font sizes. Um, obviously, we don't allow people to remove country names and capitals um, within other than what I've mentioned, which is just a fact of life. But um, yeah, it's very much, um, everything's very much bespoke. Okay, well, thank you everyone for the questions. Thank you, Peter. We'll give Peter a round of applause. Thank you.